All right, good, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Keith Green, and I'm the director of the Africana Studies Program here at Rutgers Camden. Uh, it is my distinct privilege to welcome you to tonight's program, which is entitled The Fifth Little Girl, A Conversation with Mrs. Sarah Collins Rudolph. Tomorrow at 10.22 a.m. will mark the 57th anniversary of the bombing of Birmingham's 16th Street Baptist Church by members of the Ku Klux Klan. Four little girls were killed as a direct result of that blast. Their names are Denise McNair, who was 11, Cynthia Wesley, Carol Robertson, and Addie Mae Collins, who were all 14 years old. But there was a fifth little girl who was also present and she survived. Her name is Mrs. Sarah Collins Rudolph, and she's our special guest tonight. Before we begin our program properly, I wanna note that this um, event is being recorded and everyone's mic should be muted. Um, your mic will be muted for the entirety of the program. We will have a Q&A at the end of the program, at which time you'll be able to submit questions through the chat feature of the Zoom. Um, at this point, I also wanna send out several thank yous to the many people who helped to make this evening possible. Um, you get to see my face at the beginning, but that doesn't mean that I did all the work or even most of it in some cases. And so I do wanna acknowledge all the folks who helped to make um, this evening a reality. I'd like to reach out and thank um, Dr. Howard Marcatello, Dean, of the College of Arts and Sciences at Rutgers Camden um, for providing generous support to make this evening possible, um, as well as Associate Dean Jane Siegel, um, both of them, Dr. Marcatello and Dr. Siegel, um, who believed in this project from the very beginning. I also want to acknowledge um, Julie Ronsinski and Kate Blair from the Office of Web Design who helped us spread the word about the event across our campus and um, surrounding units. I'd like to thank as well, um, Dee Johnzak, who's the secretary for the Africana Studies Program um, and who helped us to navigate some um, treacherous bureaucratic terrain when it came to processing the paperwork um, to make this event um, a reality. I'd like to acknowledge Mr. Owen Bryant, who um, we'll hear from him later um, but who is a great lover of history um, and someone who takes um, the story of um, the 16th Street bombing very seriously. So we're thankful for him um, this evening. And then I want to acknowledge, um, in some ways, many ways, my co-collaborator on this project, Dr. Rosemary Pena, um, who helped facilitate the Zoom meeting this evening, as well as the graphics. Um, her daughter, Brandy, actually um, put together the original poster um, and we'll hear from Dr. Pena later um, as well. Um, so thank you for all um, that you've done to make this evening um, a reality. And then finally, all of you who are on this call this evening, um, we made this program for you so that we could learn and talk about this history um, together. And without you, um, it wouldn't make any sense. It wouldn't be um, worth um, the work and the labor. So thank you all um, for sharing the link for telling friends, for telling family. On the call already, I can see some of my church folk family who are present. Um, I know my wife helped a great deal to kind of spread the word in our community. Um, I think the NAACP is well represented tonight, um, alongside Historical Society and several other groups um, that I'm happy to be affiliated with. So thank you all for coming out um, this evening. And again, it is being recorded. Um, so for those of you who might have friends or family um, who couldn't make it out, um, please note that in a few days, maybe a week or so, we'll have the video up and you can um, also watch it um, at that time as well. All right, so by way of kind of setting up why this event is so special, I want to briefly refer to um, an event that I saw last evening, which was the versus battle between um, Patti LaBelle and Gladys Knight. And for those of you who know, the versus battle is um, a type of program which has been happening since COVID started, where very famous entertainers come together and kind of battle with their greatest hits. And both um, Gladys Knight 
and Patti LaBelle, of course, are titans in the world of music. When we think about the civil rights movement, in many ways, their songs um, that they wrote, that they sung, um, have been the soundtrack, right, for the modern um, civil rights movement. And about half a million people were on that Zoom um, or versus battle last night. And both Mrs. Gladys Knight and Patti LaBelle, they're worthy of our attention, worthy of that versus battle. Um, but I recall looking through the comments and someone saying that um, Patti LaBelle and Gladys Knight are examples of black royalty. And tonight, I feel as if we have black royalty in our presence as well. Mrs. Sarah Collins Rudolph um, is the best of us for what she has um, experienced. Dear God, we thank you for nursing us and satisfying us. And I'm getting a bit of chatter in the background. If anybody can hear that. We're called upon to do. We pray that nothing that we did was displeasing in your sight. We continue to bless your name in Jesus. Okay, I think it's gone now. Okay. That's on, um, okay, so tonight we're celebrating our own Black royalty, um, Mrs. Sarah Collins Rudolph, and we're so happy to have you. Um, you remind us of what we've been through, but also to a great extent what we've overcome, and we're so thankful for you. Um, and what the story of Mrs. Rudolph reminds me of is also how many people um, who are unknown to us in Black history. I recall um, a couple of years ago when Rutgers Camden invited the author of the, of the book Hidden Figures, which was turned into a film um, of the same name, right, to honor Katherine Johnson, um, the Black female mathematician who helped to send human beings into space and to land on the, mu on the moon. Um, to me, Sarah Collins Rudolph is that kind of person as well, right? Someone who has helped us to define um, an era and to define a movement. So we're so grateful to have her with us this evening. Um, along with thinking of those who have been neglected or forgotten in history, I want to mention two more names as well. Um, and those two names are Virgil Ware and Johnny Robinson. And if we could have that slide, um, please, um, that would be great. Um, so both of these young boys um, were also killed on September 15th, 1963. Um, after the bombing, Black folks um, came out on Birmingham streets to protest. They were upset, they were frustrated um, at the terrible act which bombed a church and killed four little girls in the process. Johnny Robinson was out um, as well, and he was involved in a heated exchange um, with whites who were hurling racial slurs at him as well. When the police came, um, they dispersed the crowd of blacks and chased them away. And while Johnny Robinson was literally running away, a police officer with a shotgun sitting in the back of his so squad car um, discharged a shot and killed Johnny Robinson. He was only 16 years old and he died also on September 15, 1963. Virgil Ware, who was 13 years old, was riding on the handlebars of his brother's bike. And on supposedly an alleged dare, two white teens, one dare the other to shoot at this young black boy, shot at him and he was also fatally wounded. He was only 13 years old. They both died on September 15, 1963, and we mourn their losses today. So I'd just like to call out before we begin our program properly, the names of the children that we know of, right? Of our young black children who died on September 15, 1963. Denise McNair, Carol Robertson, Cynthia Wesley, Addie Mae Collins, Johnny Robinson, and Virgil Ware. Thank you. Now, as most of you know, it's impossible to have a program about Black history without singing Lift Every Voice and Sing, um, which is also known as the Black National Anthem. Um, the words were written by um, NAACP leader, 
um, Harlem Renaissance figure, African-American writer, author, activist, James Weldon Johnson. Um, the music for the song was composed by his brother, um, Rosamond Johnson. And tonight we have the special treat of having um, my close personal friend, Mr. Owen Bryant, um, to sing that song for us. Um, ordinarily, if we were all physically together, I would ask that folks, if they're able to, to rise in honor of the song, um, but you're more than welcome um, to sing along um, as the song is sung by Mr. Bryant. Um, he is an instructor at Phillips, um, excuse me, of Durham Academy in Durham, North Carolina. Um, for the last 10 years or so, probably more, he's actually led a tour of iconic civil rights locations throughout the South, um, such as the Lorraine Motel, um, and of course, 16th Street Baptist Church. Um, but he also has a phenomenal voice. And so um, right now we'll have um, Mr. Owen Bryant, um, he'll be singing, um, lift every voice and sing. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. God Thank you, Owen. Um, when we spoke um, a, few, a few days ago about him singing the song, we talked about how in many ways, um, Lift Every Voice and Sing is more than a song, and in some ways even more than an anthem, it's almost like a prayer. And so thank you for in invoking the spirit of Black excellence and Black power, um, Black survival um, with your beautiful rendition of that song. Thank you so much. Now, I'm aware that many folks are, of course, familiar with the story of the four little girls and the bombing of the 16th um, Street Church. But I know that some folks may not be aware. Um, and so I wanna make sure that folks have an opportunity to learn um, even as we discuss um, this evening. 
So what I'd like to do now is to show a short video which talks a bit about um, the 16th Street Church and its bombing in 1963. Um, it's a short video, about three minutes long, but it properly kind of sets up the conversation we'll have later with Mrs. Sarah Collins Rudolph. So at this time, um, we'd like to have that video played. Was the oldest black church in Birmingham and it was fairly large and so it made sense that meetings would happen there uh, which would also make it a target. On Sunday morning September 15th it was youth day right after Sunday school. Addie Mae Collins, Carol Robinson, Denise McNair and Cynthia Wesley are getting ready uh, to go into the choir. I remember Ad, I was closest to Addie and we would go to church picnics. Ad and I just gravitated to each other. Cynthia Wesley was a friend of mine. She was at my school. She was a ninth grader. Just started in September. And I was an 11th grader. I remember Denise back there always smiling and she was the only child. And I remember Carol Robinson being quiet. And she played in the orchestra at her school. Addie Mae's sister Sarah is also in that ladies' lounge. Sarah said the last thing that she remembers is uh, seeing them helping each other, tying on sashes, and then it went dark. We're talking about an explosion that reverberates through the entire city of Birmingham. Everybody heard it. I was at South Ellison Baptist Church, and our pastor was shifting kind of nervously across the room and said he had received word that 16th Street Baptist Church had been bombed. I was in Sunday school class. The building seemed like it was shaking off its foundation. Fumes, smelling fumes, and getting hit in the head. I couldn't find my younger sister. Only later to find out that she was taken to the hospital. She was only four. She was cut in the head blood dripping down her clothes and down her face. Reverend John Cross comes down after the explosion to go into the hole and hears moaning. My father heard somebody saying, Addie, Addie, and he realized that Sarah was calling her sister's name because that's the last voice that she heard before the explosion occurred. You find the bodies in there almost literally stacked on top of each other. He said it was like they had been blown together. It devastated me. It was just so painful to know that these girls were killed at church. They had not done anything to deserve something like that. That was enough to pull people off the fence. Kids are supposed to be safe at church. This is not supposed to happen in America. We're above this kind of thing. And so this was the catalyst to get some things moving. Thank you. So as you can see from the video, um, this is heavy material. And we think about the history um, of that day even now, right, even in 2020, September 14th, right, those shock waves are still rippling through um, our communities. Um, but we're still grateful tonight, right, to have a survivor with us, right, um, Mrs. Sarah Collins Rudolph. At this time, I'll have Dr. Rosemary Pena, who will be introducing um, our guest for this evening. And a little bit about um, Dr. Pena. Um, Dr. Pena holds a PhD in Child Studies from Rutgers University, Camden. Her research centers on transnational adoption and child migration. A member of the post-war cohort of German-born Black adoptees to the U.S., 
Rosemary is also the founding president of the Black German Heritage and Research Association. And I see a few um, BGR folk out there as well. Hello, welcome. Um, her research has defined the field of Black German adoption studies. She's too modest to say it, but it really has. And so we're so thankful to have her um, with us. A phenomenal colleague to work with and someone who I'm also honored to call my friend. Um, Dr. Pena, um, please introduce Mrs. Rudolph. Thank you, Dr. Green, for that kind introduction. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker for this evening, Mrs. Sarah Collins Rudolph. Mrs. Rudolph is indeed a survivor. On the morning of Sunday, September 15, 1963, she and her sisters Janie and Addie laughed and played on their way to the 16th Street Baptist Church, where they were expecting to take part in the usual children's Sunday services. However, a bomb planted by the KKK detonated at 10.22 a.m. and radically changed the course of their lives and American history. Along with injuring almost two dozen people, the blast fatally wounded four little girls, Sarah's older sister, Addie Mae, and three of her close friends, Denise McNair, Carol Robertson, and Cynthia Wesley. But Sarah survived the explosion that tore a gaping hole into the side of the church building, toppled its steps, and shattered its stained glass windows. She is the fifth little girl. The bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church would sear the nation's conscience, eventually leading to the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Mrs. Rudolph, however, is more than a histor historical turning point. She is a woman of deep faith and a devoted wife. She has been a committed member of Perfecting the Saints Ministry in Birmingham, Alabama for several years. Among her many awards, Mrs. Rudolph received a Harmony Award by CORE, a Congress of Racial Equality, in 2002. She is also the author of the forthcoming book, The Fifth Little Girl, The Sole Survivor of the 16th Street Baptist Church Bombing. It should be out in October. She has three living sisters, Junie, Janie, and Flora. Mrs. Rudolph lives in Forestdale, Alabama with her husband, George Rudolph, who is a Vietnam veteran. And now it is my honor to present to you, Mrs. Sarah Collins Rudolph. Thank you for that. Welcome, Mrs. Rudolph. Thank you, good afternoon. So, we're going to have a conversation this evening, um, and we want it to be informal and easy, um, as can be given the, the topic of the conversation. Um, at any point, um, if you'd like to stop or pause or simply just kind of break off, just please um, feel free to let me know. Um, we're still thankful to have you um, here with us, and for the time that we have together, um, we're really um, appreciative of you spending it, spending it with us. Thank you for having me. Sure. So people may just simply think of you as someone who survived a tragedy, but I would love to give them a sense of just who you are as a person, even before we talk about um, the events of September 15th. So could you tell us a bit about your background in terms of, for instance, um, are you from Birmingham? Is your family from Birmingham? Yes, uh, we're from Birmingham. In a area called Smithfield. Okay. Yes, I was raised there. Okay. And so growing up, what was it like um, living in Birmingham? And you can talk about the good and the bad. What was it like in terms of your childhood um, living in Birmingham? Well, we had a good childhood, you know. Um, and, and Mrs. And Rudolph, if, if you could speak up just a little bit, because the audio is a little bit low. Thank you. <laughs> At the time, we uh, had a good childhood living in, in the city of Birmingham. Mm -hmm. You know, it, uh, my family was, uh, was large. I had six sisters and, and two brothers, but this is uh, for us now, you know, mm -hmm. now. 
Okay. But uh, we would have uh, games, and when we was young, we played different kind of games, and we went to 16th Street Baptist Church, in which we had uh, uh, Bible school meeting, and we would go out and swim. We had a pretty good life. The only thing about it, it was just so uh, uh, segregated. And mm -hmm. we, we was born in during the segregation, during segregation. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was just a way of life to us. And uh, I remember how they would have signs on on the uh, doors of the restaurant what had uh, uh, color and black, and we couldn't use uh, different kind of water fountains because it was the same way. They would catch you using the white water fountain. They would arrest you, so we had to uh, stay from their fountain. Mm. And, and you talked about the church being an important part of your life. Um, and that church, the 16th Street Baptist Church, was also the oldest black church in Birmingham. Is, is that right? Very large church, and uh, that church was uh, had doctors and lawyers, and you know, dentists and teachers. Uh, they would uh, go there. Mm -hmm. uh, my parents, you know, took us there, and we started going there. We went there for while ever, ever since we was young. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to the history of the church, I also know that children were actually actively involved, right, in the protest against segregation. Did you and your, your other, you know, siblings, did you participate in some of those protests against segregation, even, even as kids? No, uh, we didn't. We didn't uh, do any protesting. But, but my mother, she would always attend. I remember on... Um, on Wednesdays uh, at in the evening at about seven o'clock, she would always go to the meeting. They called them the mass meeting. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had several uh, mass meetings at the 16th Street Baptist Church and, and different other churches around Birmingham. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that really in, in lots of ways kind of sets up then what happens right on the morning of September 15th, because that wasn't simply just, you know, a random attack against any church right? They knew that they were attacking the oldest Black church in Birmingham, right? And they were attacking a church that was central to the movement to fight segregation, right? Yeah. That's where uh, Martin Luther King would, would have his meetings there because of the fact that it was a large church and it mm -hmm. could seat men and people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I've never had the privilege of, of visiting folks, like I mentioned uh, Mr. Bryant earlier, um, have actually visited the church and seen it up close, but even from the pictures that I've seen online, um, it looks like a beautiful church. So if you could now, would you kind of walk us through the, the morning of September 15th, um, 1963, and as much as you remember of, of everything kind of leading up to the moment? Um, of, of 10.22 a.m. Well, that particular morning, I remember my mother getting us up real early to go to church because we were so excited. Uh, it was Jane, Ed, and I. We, we walked to church that morning. And while we were walking, Jane had a little purse shaped like a, a football. And we were just throwing it and, and catching it, just having so much fun. All the way there, we walked about a mile and about a mile and a half. And uh, when we arrived that morning, uh, we came on down to the basement where our class was. Janet's class was upstairs where the where the uh, most of the older girls were. So when we came downstairs to uh, freshen up, uh, she went on she went on upstairs and she told us she said, "Added, you and Sarah, make sure you go to your class." So we said, okay, but we didn't go in that morning simply because the class was already, you know, in session. So uh, while we was in the ladies' lounge, that's when I started looking out the door, just our class sit out in the middle of the floor and I can see them from the ladies' lounge. So 
uh, I, I continually look out just waiting for us to turn out, my class to turn out. And that's when I seen Denise McNair, Cynthia Wesley and Carol Robson, they came on into the door and they spoke to us and went on the other side where the uh, stalls were located. So when they came out, they came out together simply, simply because there were about three stalls on that side. So when she, Ada was standing by the one, and that's where the couch was located. And Denise walked over there and, and asked Ada to tie the sash on her dress. And when she reached her hand out to tie the sash, and I would just, we all stood there to look at a uh, tie. And all of a sudden I heard this noise, boom. And I hollered, Addie, Addie, Addie. And she didn't answer. So I didn't know what, it, what it had happened. I thought they had ran on back on the other side where the uh, class was. So then all of a sudden I heard someone holler, they bombed the 16th Street Church. And that voice was so clear as though this person was inside with us, but right where they were standing, it blew a crater. And uh, I found out this person's name was uh, uh, later on. He was one of our deacons. His name was Samuel Rutledge. And he said when he heard the noise downstairs, he, he decided to uh, come down the steps. And when he looked to get on the, come down the step, he seeing that the steps were blown away. So he jumped down to see what it was. And he saw me just standing there, he told me. So he, when he seen me, he picked me up in his arm and he carried me out to, to the ambulance. They was already out there waiting. So they rushed me to uh, Hilma Hospital. It's University Hospital now, but they rushed me there. And uh, when I got there, Somebody said that I had to uh, wait on the couch. So I waited there because they said that the doctor wasn't in, the eye doctor wasn't in because the debris had went flying in, you know, into my eyes and face and I couldn't see anything. So uh, later, uh, while I laid there, my sister Janet came in and I asked her, I said, where is Ed? She said that Ed had hurt her back. And she was going to come to visit me tomorrow. So I said, okay. But I guess she said that because she didn't want me to uh, get upset by what had happened to Ed. But anyway, they rushed me on uh, upstairs and operated on my eyes. And, and uh, when they was finished, I came to my room. And that's when my mother was upstairs. And she told me that. That's when I found out that all the girls that was in the ladies' lounge with me, they was killed, and I was the only survivor. Mm. I mean, I can't imagine the emotions you, you must have felt. One, from the bombing itself, and then two, to start to slowly kind of realize that your sister and your friends, right, had all been killed. I was just wondering uh, why did they kill Ed and the other girls? And uh, they were so sweet, sweet, sweet girls, all of them. I never did hear neither one of them saying a bad thing about any anyone. He was schooled and made good grades and school and everything. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just kept wondering why were they killed? Mm -hmm. Could you say a bit more about your your sister Addie Mae? Because um, I'm sure you, you you knew her best. And sometimes we'll hear these names in history, and just think of them as you know a name and an age. Um, but you knew her. That that was your you know that was your 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 big sister. Could you tell us a little bit more about her personality? What she liked to do? Um, who who was Addie Mae? She was, was so sweet and, and so humble, and. Uh, she loved to, uh, she just loved people and everybody loved her too. And uh, she was, she made good grades in school and we was always together. When you see her, we would go to different places together. I remember at the time, uh, my mother would make aprons and sell aprons. And we would always uh, be together selling aprons. And 
the kids in our neighborhood, we had plenty of kids in our neighborhood uh, whenever uh, we wanted to uh, start a baseball game. Ada was always there. She loved to play baseball and uh, she loved to uh, play all the different kind of games that we would play. You know, she was just a sweet girl mm -hmm. and never and never said anything bad about no one. You can get along with her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, e even in the story, the story as you tell it, the, the last thing that she did, right, she was taking care of someone else. Denise McNair was the youngest of the group and she asked Addie, right, to tie her sash. So, so that tells me that she was also a caretaker, right? She, she took care of other people, which is a nice way to remember her. And if anybody, you know, get into fights or fuss, Ed was always there to say, tell us, uh, you know, stop. She was, she just was that type of person. Sounds like it. Um, in, in terms of the, the effects, and, and there are multiple ways to talk about the effects of, of, of what happened to you. And, and in the corner, folks can probably see this picture that your, um, your husband placed there earlier, right? It's, it's of the Life magazine photograph that someone took of you, um, I believe that the next day after, after the bombing. Um, and as you said, because of the debris, which flew into your face and also into your eye, right? You couldn't see anything. Um, could you talk a bit about kind of what life was like for you after, you know, after the bombing and after um, the injuries to you? After the bombing, uh, everything had changed, you know, since uh, you see the picture with the patches on my eye. I remember when uh, the doctor took them off he asked me, uh, what do I see out of my left eye? And I told him, I said, I see a little light. And he said, asked me the same thing, what do you see out of your right eye? And I told him I couldn't see anything. So I was blinded suddenly from the glass. And uh, I had to go back to school about a week after I uh, left the hospital. And I had to get used to, really get used to uh, seeing out just one eye again. I wasn't as playful in school. Uh, I wanted to go out and, and and eat like I used to. I would go out for recess, but by me having that just one hour, I stopped. I just didn't do that anymore because uh, I remember how uh, before I left the hospital, they told my mother to bring me back in February because they was going to have to remove my right eye. Because if they didn't remove my right eye, I would go blind in my left eye. So things had changed. My grades had changed. I was an A student at first, but I just didn't do the work like I used to. It changed everything. Of course, right. You, you note that, um, so the, week, the next week, you, you returned to school after all of this happened? It was uh, it was kind of hard, you know, at, by being at the age of twelve. I didn't know anything about getting counseling or anything like that, so I had to go back to school in a terrible condition. I was uh, uh, I was still having a nervous condition, and I would hear that sound all the time when I would uh, uh, go places and hear cars backfiring. I would still jump like. I would hear that bomb over and over again. But I just had to uh, go ahead on through life and, and live. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And of course, not, now I realize that what you experienced was, was real trauma. I, I recall speaking to your husband, Mr. Rudolph, and him being a Vietnam veteran and talking about recognizing the signs of trauma, right, and, and, and PTSD. Um, but that's so hard to think that, you know, you had to you know, go back to school and try to pretend as if things were normal when so many things had changed for you. Um, how was your, how did your family, I mean, I couldn't, again, like, how did your family um, change, you know, the dynamics change after, you know, losing your sister, um, what, you know, the injuries to you, what happens to your friends, um, what happened to the church, how did the family, um, how were they impacted by that? 
very hurt about it, about what happened. And you can just see see it on their faces because there was something that happened to us that should never have been. And they wouldn't, they wouldn't talk much about it, but you can just, I can just look on their face and, and just see the hurt that they had to go through. But uh, it was just devastating that our family had to go through something like that for no reason at all, you know. Mm -hmm. And I'm so sorry for it. So we know that eventually um, three members of the KKK were eventually um, pointed out um, and to some extent held responsible um, for the bombing of the church and for the murders of four little girls and for the injuries um, to you and, and to other folks. Um, but it was really justice delayed, right? Um, in so many different ways. Um, and, and just for, for the record, so folks know this, um, the three men's names are Robert Shambliss, um, and he was finally convicted in 1977. This bombing happened in 1963, um, and he wasn't convicted until 1977. He only spent eight, spent eight years um, in prison, and he died at 81 years old, right? For killing, you know, little girls who were who were teenagers, right? Um, we also have Bobby Cherry, um, convicted in 2002. Um, he lived to be 74 years old, and then Thomas Bland, convicted in 2001, um, who just died um, this past summer in 2020, right? Lived to be 82 years old. Um, could you talk to me about kind of what that makes you feel to know that these men had a chance to live into their 70s and 80s, um, you know, after what they had done? Yes, you know, it was a shame that they uh, went to the bar of justice and it took them 39 years to uh, bring them to the bar of justice. And, but you know, the girls, they didn't get a chance to live their life. They did everything they, they wanted to do. And they work, they enjoy it, their families and, and, and everything, but these uh, girls were just shot, shot, just bombed at an at a early age and they didn't get a chance to even have a family. So uh, I always, uh, uh, they all really knew who they were because several of the men, they gave them nicknames. They gave uh, uh, Robert Chambers a uh, dynamite bar and they gave Cherry they call him Cherry Bomb. They knew who, they knew who they were. I don't know why they waited that long to, to uh, have their trial. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and, and I've, I've totally everything that I've read um, confirms what what you're telling us as well, right? That it was open secret. There, there was no doubt about who committed these heinous acts. Um, if if your if your nickname is Dynamite Bob, then it's pretty clear what you're about and, and what you've done. Um, you, you, you note that um, that justice really wasn't served in, in the cases, um, you know, of your friends and, and your sister. Were you involved? Um, did they call you to testimony or testify in any of the trials that, that, that took place? Were you involved in any of those court proceedings? I was involved in all three of the trials because they wanted to, uh, to wanted me to tell what happened on that day. So I went to all of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, I'm, I'm, and I'm sure that was a difficult experience as well, after having suffered so much, then to have to, to recount it, right, in a court setting as well. It was just like just opening up, wound. it was opening up, wounds had been closed for years, you mm -hmm. know, because of, of the fact that they uh, was bragging about it, you know, about uh, uh, for and Gary Jake uh, bombed in the, in the 16th Street Baptist Church, and that just wasn't right. And then we see that the, that the city of, of Birmingham and also the, the uh, Bull Connor and and uh, all the other uh, people in office, they was involved in it. Governor Wallace was involved, and uh, 
they didn't bring those guys to justice like they should have mm -hmm. because they was all involved in it themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about, and I'm glad you, you bring this point up. So when we talk about the bombing of the 16th um, Street Church, sometimes it's framed as if it's simply just a matter of the KKK and these three men who were a part of the KKK. But it was more than a KKK, right? It was the police department, right, who were complicit. It was the mayor's office, right, the governor. And in fact, the entire state of Birmingham, entire state of Alabama, right, is, is, is you know, basically implicated in this crime because how would it have taken that many years to bring these men to justice if people were not co-signing, if they were not silent? They, they uh, wanted to keep it quiet and it happened as though it didn't happen. But uh, they knew what they were doing because they didn't want us to have our civil rights. Mm -hmm. They wanted us to like just stay in our place. But I just thank God that uh, the civil rights bill was uh, signed and a little order, you know, came in the city of Birmingham after that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, and so definitely the next year in 64, we do have the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which is a landmark um, achievement. But unfortunately, right, um, your sister's life and her friend's life as well, right, um, was part of the process that took for people to finally recognize how wrong segregation was and how much right, Blacks had, had, had suffered. Um, and we've talked a bit about this, um, you know, before, before this evening. And I know for, for you, some people might call it reparations. Some folks might call it um, restorative justice. Um, and I think I've heard you use the term before, um, restitution. Um, given all that you suffered, right? And given um, what your family suffered and the community has suffered, um, do you think the city of Birmingham should do more to address and, and redress what has happened to you? Yeah. Uh, the reason why I say this, since the city was involved in, 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 in uh, they wanted segregation forever, you know, like uh, Governor Wallace says, segregation now, segregation tomorrow, mm -hmm. and segregation forever. Mm -hmm. They was involved, and I should get restitution for my injury because they was, uh, uh, Doing, you know, making uh, all these things happen in Birmingham, the police dogs on people and the uh, and uh, billy sticks, you know, all this. Uh, these was people in government, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. She deserved it, Doctor Green. She deserved it. I agree Ain't with no Rudolph. About it. I agree, and, and that's the voice oh, of see, Mr. Rudolph chiming in. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between Sarah? What happened to her was a terrorist act. Mm -hmm. So with 9-11, that was a terrorist act. Boston Marathon was a terrorist act. Those families got uh, restitution. So it's only fair that Sarah would receive it. She should have been got it. Mm -hmm. But Alabama turned a blind eye and just say, it like ain't nothing happened. Mm -hmm. So uh, restitution, uh, uh, would help because of the fact that I still have uh, a piece of glass in my left eye. My, my uh, doctor don't want to uh, bother it simply because it's just sitting there. And uh, I still had to go to the doctor for that eye every, every four months. And uh, they just hadn't stepped up to uh, try to help. They want to they uh, act as if uh, Birmingham has been like this all along, but we had some hard times back then in the 60s. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, so even 57 years after the fact, you're still dealing with the psychological, the physical um, consequences of, of what happened to you. And certainly to, to me, it seems only fair that the yes, city, sir. that the state should step up and, and take care of its own. You are a citizen of Birmingham. You do deserve all of the rights um, that go along with that. Um, and so, so I totally agree. In, in, in terms of, and, and this is something we've talked about as well, um, in the popular media, the way in which 
the bombing of um, the 16th Street Church ha has been handled. And I, and I mentioned to you, um, you know, The Four Little Girls, for example, which is a documentary produced, um, directed by, by Spike Lee, right? Um, and you talked about, you know, the fact that you weren't in that documentary and why, would you share with us kind of what happened with that and, and why that is? Well, you know, uh, he asked me, did I want to be in it? You know, mm -hmm. when he asked me, I was still struggling with uh, uh, the fact that uh, my injuries, you know, I was still getting money to get my eyes checked. And when I asked him, was he going to uh, uh, pay me anything for getting in, he told me no. He said, he said that the money was going for scholarship, but I just, I just uh, figured uh, if it was going to scholarship, he could have, you know, did something to help me. You know, it, it was nice for the for the uh, help with scholarship. So I just didn't want to uh, talk. You know, I just told him I didn't want to have anything to say to him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You did right too. Mm -hmm. And certainly when you when you tell your story, it's not simply a story, it's what happened to you. It's your real, actual, lived pain. Um, and no monetary, you know, amount could ever compensate for that, but it's worth something. It's, it's worth your time. So I certainly and your, uh, understand your, your position on that. Um, we've talked about the film Selma as well, right? Um, which also in some sense distorts kind of what happened to you. Do you want to say a bit about Selma as well? A Ava DuVernay Selma? Uh, we went to see Phil when he, we, uh, they let us have a showing before the big private showing. And uh, when we went to see it, we was, we seen the girls coming down the steps and it was full. And, but you know, it was, it was, uh, didn't have anything in there about it with the fifth girl. So when we seen that and, and the uh, noise that the bomb made with them coming down the steps, it just scared me and my husband so bad till it was as though we was, I was going back through the bomb. It was big bang, you know? Cause wow. I didn't, I didn't know uh, figure that by those girls walking down the step, that sound would come. So those girls were really in the uh, uh, latest uh, lounge when that happened. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so when you aren't consulted and when you aren't, um, you know, either invited or compensated to be a part of the process, then history gets distorted. And that's why we're so grateful tonight to have you to tell us the truth, because you were there, you lived it. And so, um, like no one else can, right, you can tell us, right, um, what it means um, to go through and, and, and to live through history. Um, and we're so thankful for that. And, and I think about this in terms of also storytelling, in terms of how people also paint the picture that once, as you're saying, kind of Birmingham wants to move on and paint a picture as if everything is hunky-dory, everything is fine. But as you're saying, things are not fine, right? Um, and I think about even how people kind of teach or talk about films like Four Little Girls as if it's a story of forgiveness and moving on. But as we're seeing, there's still real physical, psychological hurt that's here right now in 2020. Um, and that's not simply gonna go away. Um, I, I wanted to know kind of how have you just psychologically kind of dealt with what you've gone through just so you can maintain and, you know, and, and be at some kind of peace. How have you dealt with all that you've been through? Uh, it's prayer. And uh, I've been, uh, I stayed in church and uh, I know it was God that brought me out of the church. So I stay and, and I, I just give God the praise and the honor because one day I was sitting in a church and a, a pastor came up to me and he, he, he was telling me what God was showing him about me. And he told him that God was showing him that I, I was suffering with fear and I had a nervous condition. And when he laid his hands on me and he prayed, that's when... Uh, uh, the things that I was afraid to do in church, I started doing because I always wanted to uh, stand up and testify and, and, and do things like uh, getting on the Urshia board. And after that, I, I started, after prayer, I, I began to be a, a devotion leader. And I got on the Urshia board, started serving on the Urshia board. 
So I think uh, I know there was there's God that laid his hands on me. And mm-hmm. I was uh, a better person after that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, I, I certainly would agree. I mean, when you look at the pictures and the images, the hole that was blown through the side of the church and the explosion was so powerful that the glass was knocked out of the windows across the street. And to think of you as a little 12 year old girl still standing in, in the midst of that, that that's nothing short of, of, of a miracle, right? So, so we yes, thank sir. God for yes, that. Right. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir, doctor. Yeah, so I just give him praise because I wouldn't be alive if it had not been for him because when I began to see how the church looked, I always say to myself, oh, I know it was God that bought me out. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you, you, you've told your story in a book, and I want to make sure to get the, to get the, name, get the name right. Um, it's called The Fifth Little Girl, Soul Survivor of the 16th Street Baptist Church Bombing, the Sarah Collins Rudolph story. And I know you said you've been working on that book um, for, for, for many years. Could you just talk about that process and, and what it's been like? I had a, a ghostwriter to, to, to write it. Mm-hmm. And everything that has been happening throughout the years, that's what's in the book. You know, mm-hmm. and, I, I, and I think, and I talks about how God had healed me, uh, and, and uh, how I had to repent and give my life to God, and that's when all the healing, you know, came. Because uh, nowadays, you know, uh, we go through things in life, and people don't. Uh, uh, acknowledge God. So the, the word of God tells us we got to acknowledge God in everything that we do. So that's what I do. I, I acknowledge him and, and talk to him even before I talk to people uh, about the bomb. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So uh, he give me that peace that I need. Mm-hmm. So inside the book, I talk, uh, talk about my life, how my life uh, uh, change and how I had to forgive the, these clans because I didn't want this to uh, want to go through life being angry because when I was young I was very angry about you know the death of those girls and my injury but I had to uh, get, uh, tell God about it and, and let him heal me because I didn't want to carry that hate all through my life because, you know, hate just only bring sickness onto you. So Mm -hmm. I just had to forgive those guys. Certainly, as an act of self-preservation and self-love, right, to to maintain your own self. Amen. You you talk about um, the book, and so the book should be out in October, and I believe you said it's being produced by Africa World Press. Is is that correct? Africa World Press? Okay. So, So... and, and so I would just encourage folks who happen to be on, on the Zoom meeting this evening that if we don't see that book in October, <laughs> that we should be emailing, right, and contacting Africa World Press because I know that you've worked on this book um, for a very long time. It's a very important story. Other folks have been telling the story, and I'm not going to, you know, pick sides or knock anyone else, but I'm talking to you right now. So I know your story. I know it's coming from you directly, and I would love to see your story in print. I would love to see you get the credit that you deserve for being a survivor and being such a phenomenal person. So I know definitely I'll be looking for that book and also contacting Africa World Press to, to ask questions about when and where and, and, and how right, will this book um, be a prayer because we want to hear your story. We want to hear it from, from you. Thank you, right. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm. So the Africa World Press is up there by you somewhere in New Jersey. It, it, it is, and, and so definitely, I think we, we can do something to exert some, you know, exert some community pressure, right, to, to make this happen. Um, yes, now, now, I know you're also, folks might be wondering, well, how can I, you know, learn more about and talk to and perhaps even have, you know, Mrs. Sarah Collins Rudolph come to my institution or, or my group, and so I know you're on Twitter, right, and I'll actually put, um, I believe I have it here, um, put your Twitter um, handle 
in the chat so folks can see it. And you also have a website. So your Twitter handle is at Sarah, R-U-D-O-L-P. And your website is Sarah Collins Rudolph, right, dot com. So let me put that into the chat if folks want to. Sarah Collins Rudolph at gmail.com. Dot com. Dot com. Facebook, okay. Instagram. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so they can also email you. And say that email address one more time, please. Sarah Collins Rudolph at gmail.com. I'll put that up there as well. Okay, so you can definitely reach out to Mrs. Collins and um, have her come enlighten um, your community as well. Um, I want to also open it up to, to question and answers um, from the people who are on the, the meeting. And I'm thankful for all of you who came out. We have a, a, a good number this evening. And so it shows that people are interested and, and care about um, what happened to you and also your continuing life right, um, flourishing after that point. So if folks have questions, um, please um, submit them now. Um, we're not making um, anyone, we're not taking anyone off mute because we'd like to make sure we can control the questions and that all the questions are respectful. Um, but if you have a question, please go ahead and submit that through um, the chat feature. I do see a question um, about the recording, um, when it will be available. And so hopefully within the next week or so, the recording of this event um, should be available on the, on the Africana Studies website. Um, so you can go to our website where you saw the link for the event um, and hopefully with around a week or so, we'll be able to turn that around and you can um, share the event with others. So for, perhaps for folks who couldn't make it this evening for whatever reason, um, you can go back and actually watch the video um, there. Okay, and someone's asking for the link to the website. Um, let me see. I'll give that to you in a second. Let me just pull, um, pull that up. Okay, so I'm placing that now in our chat. There's the link to the website. And so just check back in in a few days and you'll be able to um, see the video of tonight's event there. All right, you're welcome. So as folks are kind of formulating th th their questions and, I, and I, see, I see one question now, and this is from um, Linda Shockley, um, who is the president um, of the Lawnside Historical Society, um, a, a group which I'm also a part of and, and sit on the board. Thank you so much for your question, um, Linda. Um, her question is, what actions can be taken um, or what is being done now to seek restitution? Well, right now, I have some lawyers. I have some lawyers that is working uh, with me in, uh, to get restitution. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So you do have a legal team that, that, that's working on it as well. Yes. Mm-hmm. And I think that, for instance, um, from our side of things, what we can also do is to apply pressure. I noticed that one of the things that you talked about when you mentioned restitution was having the city of Birmingham issue you an official apology, right? To, to issue an official apology. So the, the, the mayor's office, the city council, all of those things are, are publicly available information. We should be then emailing, right? The mayor of Birmingham, the, the city council, um, you know, we should be contacting them to apply pressure to say, why has there not been an official apology issued for Mrs. Sarah Collins Rudolph, her family, the victim's families, and so forth, right? We should be saying that she needs, right, um, medical care provided free of charge, right, from the state. There's no reason why you should be paying. Um, for medical care for the injuries that you suffered as a result of something which was really state-sanctioned state -sanctioned, um, sanctioned violence. And so I think for our part as well, we should be also reaching out to people um, who are in positions of power to, to apply that pressure. But th that, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. So we have a, a great question from, from Dolly. 
Um, and she said, and I'll read exactly what she what she's written. Good evening, all. Um, hello, Mrs. Collins um, Rudolph. I would like to know what your thoughts are um, of the current movements regarding the African American community in today's climate. And I'm assuming movements like Black Lives Matter and so forth. What do you think of the current movements um, regarding Af the African American community in today's climate? For one thing, I think about the movement and, and what's, what's going on that they haven't really treated black people fair, fair. simply because of the fact that the police is going out killing our black men and they getting off like nothing happened. And uh, if it was uh, something like that happened to the white guy, you know, they would put them on trial and, and be fair, but they, they're not giving us uh, fairness for, for the things that they're doing to our black men. They're not putting them in jail, they just letting them go. And uh, this is wrong. And uh, all this uh, hatred has come out, racism has come out uh, simply because we don't have a, 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 a president to fight, talk against it, you know. I remember one saying, he said, when you arrest the blacks, don't treat them fair, don't treat them good. Just, just you know, just do that what they want to do, but that's not the way to handle that. They should treat, uh, treat uh, the police uh, by putting them in jail and make them be accountable for what they are doing to the, our black men and black women. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Certainly. And when we talk about, you know, movements like defund the police, that isn't saying that we won't have police at all, but it's saying that we're going to divert the money that we spend funding the police to initiatives that protect, right, black people and people of color, right? And so police have to be held accountable and you can't be funded. If, if anyone goes to work and you don't do the right thing, you don't expect to have a job on Monday morning, right? So the police should not have a blank check to do whatever they want um, and keep on receiving funding. Right, you're right about that. Mm -hmm. You got to, uh, you yeah, got yeah. to uh, put them, put them in jail for what mm -hmm. they do because we see it already on a screen. What they, the thing they are doing is is wrong. You know, you don't shoot people in the back, Same and time. you don't. You don't put your knee on a person until they're almost dead. So why should they go loose it and, 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 uh, and then get paid for the wrong they do? They need to put them in the jail. Put them mm -hmm. in jail. Mm -hmm. Definitely, certainly. Um, we have another question from, from Dr. Pena, and, and her question is simply kind of um, framed towards when this happened to you, you were only 12 years old. And so perhaps there are you know, kids, right, of various ages who are on the, the meeting tonight, and they might be wondering, you know, um, what can I do as a, as a young person? So do you have any special thoughts or words um, for young folks who might be hearing your story and kind of thinking about how it matters for them as well? What, what would you say to, to the young people? Well, for one thing, I would like to tell them to uh, stay in the word of God. Because that the word of God is what we live by. The word of God it tells you when you're wrong, and it tells you when you when you're right, and it gives you an example of, of to how to live. And, and right now, we got to uh, uh, love one another, and we got to treat e each other as though we care for each other, because that's that's the wrong attitude that we are getting now. People are hating people without a cause. So I, I just like for them to uh, stay in that word of God and it will teach them how to live and how to love because mm -hmm. uh, love is of God, but hate is of the devil. And uh, the Bible let us know that uh, uh, all liars, that they're not gonna enter into his kingdom. It just gives you so many examples of how to, to live this life. Mm -hmm. So that's what I go back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you know, you were talking earlier about, you know, being shy to, to testify. And, and I think you, you, you've been testifying all night, right? Because <laughs> your, your life was a testimony. And, and I looked on your, your website and saw all these 
um, you know, pictures of you in front of massive crowds and at the podium at various places, institutions. And so I'm so happy to see that even despite all that happened to you, right? Um, you're such a phenomenal speaker and a phenomenal encourager and, and motivator. So we're, we're so lifted up by that because your story is not simply one of tragedy. It's not simply one of, um, you know, being beat down. It's, it's one of getting back up. And in fact, you, you never sat down, right? Even through the bombing, right? You stood up the whole time. Living for myself, you know. <laughs> Nowadays, people not gonna take care. You got to get out there and get it. <laughs> right, right. I hear that. I hear that. I hear that. Definitely, definitely. Um, well, we're so thankful to have you tonight. Um, I wonder if I could just close by asking you just to maybe a couple. I, I see it's such a beautiful room that you have in, in the background. I see a fireplace, the, the brick fireplace. Did you want to just comment on maybe one or two pictures that you have on a mantle? I, I see one where it's four little girls I see in the, in the corner holding their hands. Did you want to say a bit about those things? Yes, that's that's uh, that's uh, my family. Picture the family picture. I'm gonna show you my family picture over there in the corner. Uh, this is a picture of my family. Okay. This is uh, this is my other sister. Her name was Ada too, but she was Ada B. And okay. this is <laughs> this Flora, mm -hmm. and this Johnny, and this one of my brother, this Oscar. And this is my brother, Roy, both of them have passed. And uh, this is Janie. And this is my mother right here. And this is me. That's me. Wow. Mm -hmm. I love that picture. That's so beautiful. <laughs> and I see the picture also of Addie up top, right, right, in, right in the center. Yeah, that's beautiful. So, so you said there were, there were two Addies. So one was Addie B and one was Addie C. Eddie May, Eddie May, Eddie May B. Okay. <laughs> you know, okay. that's why I guess she named it like A and B. They may be, they may have a good life, you know. <laughs> oh, gosh, I love that. Well, thank you so much. Um, this has been a beautiful evening, and we thank you again for, again, testifying for your testimony for your beautiful life despite all the difficulty to persevere and to give us something to hold on to. Um, Rutgers Camden um, was proud to host you tonight and we're so thankful for you being here. Um, I have your number, you have mine. Sometimes we've called each other in the last couple of weeks, even by accident. So, so we'll stay in contact. You know that you have friends here, support here, and we'll be making those calls, right? Making those emails um to the mayor to the city council to africa world press um because you deserve justice you deserve proper treatment in all the ways that are possible and all that we can do we're going to try to do our best um to have that happen um so thank you thank you um so much thank you and, and again for everyone out there listening note that we do um this is being recorded and so in about a week or so um please expect to look on the website and we'll have that up for you. So for those who might've missed it, you can share it. Um, you can use it to teach. You can use it for any number of purposes um, just to kind of lift up this story and the incredible life. Um, so thank you all um, and have um, a great evening. <laughs>